so, someone made a beautiful um, explanation to me recently about when Jesus was asleep in the boat and the s- disciples were panicking because of the storm, thought they were going to perish. If you go to the Holy Eucharist now in the mass or reserved in the tabernacle or in adoration, you will get that same sense of peace that Jesus had when he's sleeping in the storm. He was not bothered by the waves and the wind. And we can get that right now, today, if we go to adore our Lord in Holy Mass or in in the tabernacle. everybody to joseph brothers uh channel today we have the great honor of having a good guest a great guest father uh, james maudsley as a way of introduction father james is a traditional catholic priest and he has been so since 2016 uh, being ordained through the priestly fraternity of saint peter or fssp Um, father is also the author of uh well, published recently two books called Adam's Deep Sleep, The Passion of Jesus Christ Prefigured in the Old Testament, and Crushing Satan's Head, The Virgin Mary's Victory of the Antichrist, foretold in the Old Testament. So, right. Father, we're going to go into a topic that's pretty broad and big. So I do want to try. We'll try to keep it as simple as possible for the lay person. This is not a theology class. It's, it's, it's basically a a discussion as if you and I were friends over dinner. We wanted to talk about a, an interesting concept or, or topic, I should say. So the, the subject is uh, truth and what is truth. Now, I'm going to read some scripture on this really quick because it's, it's relevant to what we're going to discuss about. So we find in St. John's Gospel, this is the, the most famous one. It goes to the question of our discussion. So what is truth? So uh, we have Jesus before Pilate, and Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? Now this is, uh, I'm sorry, Gospel of John, I believe 1937. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, for this, for this was I born, and for this came I into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And Pilate, and Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now, I also want to read one, uh, two more passages. That will get us uh, juiced up, I think, for our discussion. Very short. Uh, and also in John, chapter 8, 44, I believe. And Jesus says, you are, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he stood not in the truth, because the truth is not in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. And one final passage, Father. Uh, this is a little longer, but it's chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Know also this, that in the last days shall come dangerous times. Men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, haughty, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, wicked without affection, without peace, slanderers, incontinent, unmerciful, without kindness, traitors, stubborn, puffed up, and lovers of pleasures more than of God, having an appearance indeed of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now these avoid, for of these sort are they who creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, who are led away with diverse desires. This is the salient point. Ever learning, and never attaining to the knowledge of truth. And I cannot express a more vivid description of 2023. Do you agree, Father? Right. Things are unraveling fast. Scarily Um, fast, yes. And have been since the beginning, and necessarily will, given the, the murderous lies of the devil who's undoing the truth spoken by God from the beginning. Everything, uh, one small truth I'll throw in there very quickly is just to say I'm no longer with the FSSP. So 
they're not responsible for oh, yeah I, I actually yeah because of our earlier discussion that was sort of written into that other part so i forgot to mention that and, and no father problem. uh why are you no longer with the fssp if it's if it's not too personal a question no that's fine um i we have a, a mad anti-catholic tyrant dressed in white sitting in rome on the sea of saint peter truth he's trying to destroy the catholic faith he has to be resisted and spoken out against um but the thing is with mad tyrants they they control people through fear bishops are afraid of him priests are afraid of their bishops but if you speak out and speak the truth then it's very likely that th that they're not very um picky in their punishments you know they they can take down a lot of people with indiscriminate fire as it were so i think if you want to say that francis is anti-catholic destroying the faith that what he's doing to the traditional mass is the work of the devil whether he knows it or not i don't know whether he knows it or not i don't know what is in his head but that's objectively what it is then it's best to be separate perhaps from any hierarchy or body in the church to say these things um I, I lost my ministry because of the whole COVID tyranny. I refused to do things to compel the faithful to comply with that. I refused to comply myself to make the liturgy unworthy with their ridiculous, ineffective um, measures. Yes, and for that and, I and was some of them. The some of them are uh, some of the measures they took are what I consider um, sacrilegious. Right. Yeah. So we shouldn't have any part in that. Mm -mm. So I'd, I'd lost the ministry and then I had, you can either sit and wait for things to improve or I chose to distance myself from any um, other priests and then just try and say as best as I can what I think is going on and this what people are afraid to say. Um, yes. And people will bring up the example of Padre Pio, for example. They say, you know, he couldn't say confessions for so long. But they misunderstand, not only is, was he religious, which is different to a secular priest under True. the degree of obedience, right. what, the punishment on him, although it was unjust, it was a lawful thing. And actually, we are mostly obliged to follow a lawful decision. Right. Even if it's a bad choice, we can't second guess our superiors. But when, for example, a cardinal says you can't give communion on the tongue in this archdiocese, mm -hmm. well, that's an unlawful command. It's illegal, and it is to be rejected everywhere immediately. Uh, because it doesn't among, help to comply. Because among many things, it's untrue. It's not true. Yeah, it's absurd. It's also starving the children to death, which you right. can't do. But shall we rewind a bit back to the um, this murderous lies from the beginning and the truth that God spoke in creation? Yes. With creating man and woman for example mm -hmm. and then saying that their union is a one flesh union mm -hmm. uh, it's not dissoluble except by death and the purpose of it is that they multiply mm -hmm. so right there in the first two chapters of genesis we have god speaking to create the whole world things according to their kind their type their nature and he gives us this law of marriage that a man and woman come together for the sake of children and the devil starts unpicking that from the beginning. We've now reached a stage where a, a mother was telling me yesterday that her teenager at school, they have a fairly, some sensible kids in that year group. Mm -hmm. But in the year above or below, they're into their 73 genders and people mm -hmm. self-identifying as cats or fairies. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a relatively good school. And if you have, they say two or three kids with a strong character who decide to go down the woke road there's very little you can do to stop half the year group following them now right. this this is so mindless illogical dangerous it feels like satan is being unleashed on the earth but it's well, he, a consequence go ahead i'm sorry so i'm going on on I, th I think it's it's a process that's taken thousands of years if we mm -hmm. just think from divorce with henry the eighth tied to his schism from Rome so he could have a divorce. Then divorce spread through the aristocracy. Then the rich would be able to get divorce. And then 400 years later, they start making it easier and easier by law to get a divorce. 
After that, they bring in laws allowing contraception. Uh, the Lambeth Conference, and I think in 1930, said the, the Anglican communion, whatever that is, will accept contraception. Right, right. Then we see abortion spreading. And if because if you can have divorce, you might as well have contraception and abortion because it's no longer about the kids. Well, and you're undoing those food. In, interesting you bringing that up because part of my notes was, now I'm, I'm sure as an Englishman, you're aware of uh, uh, Peter Hitchens, not Christopher Hitchens, but Peter Hitchens, who I, mm -hmm. I do actually like a lot of what he has to say. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, obviously he's not Catholic, but he brings up the point that that you just brought up that just went out of my mind. <laughs> Darn it. Is it to do with the Lambeth Conference? No, it was about it was about the idea that you were saying that this is a process that's been going on. Now, Peter Hitchens is saying that the 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 homosexual and the sodomite movements that we are suffering under are actually secondary to the original problem, which he ironically being Church of England was about divorce. He says when when yeah. in modern times, when divorce it's only been relatively in the 50s and 60s that divorce became acceptable things. He says when, mm -hmm. when we started with divorce, that was when all the rest of it would come as its evil fruit. He says the, the attack on the family as the ultimate truth is the ultimate uh, government, the ultimate cell of government. Right. So and as Catholics, we, trace... we can be proud and say, look, one of the things we've stood on even today, as hard as Bergoglio tries – we are not going to say outright anyway that divorce is okay and legal. We have not. It's one of the things yeah. Catholics have held. I, th I think, though, if we analyze this dissent, we see actually we've, all of us have contributed to the dissent, apart from Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Right. Right from Adam and Eve, because where it goes from abortion is you can then have gay marriage because if you can murder the children of a union and it's just about the sexual pleasure or the emotional satisfaction they find in each other, then why not two men? But if you can have two men together, then sex loses its meaning and you can have transgender. Mm -hmm. And if transgender is a thing, why not 70 genders and school children identifying as cats and fairies? Okay, so well, let, me, let me wind you back on that point, Father. I don't mean to, but we're trying, to, so the topic is truth in itself as an essence is a thing. So basically I've always held, and I'm not boasting or anything, but it always occurred to me that the biggest reason that God was very upset with Sodom and Gomorrah over this evil that we're suffering under now is that it's an ultimate denial of truth. And if, as we accept from the Bible scripture, I read that Jesus himself is not a truth. He does not bring the truth. He is literally the truth. He is the truth. In fact, I saw this very interesting. It was a Protestant, but he did this thing where he took the word Jesus out and he just put the word truth in. And it literally does not fail English. It is perfectly, it lands a meaning, right. an essence throughout the whole scripture. You can just replace the word Jesus with truth. So if yep. we, if we, as we have done, so it starts thousands of years ago, a Genesis, even like you say, but if we look in more modern times, like the uh, the French Revolution, uh, the beginning of a Voltaire, Rousseau, and Descartes, these people disconnected truth from a vertical, objective thing to a to a flat plane, to an egalitarianism that basically made man the center of all things, and man to make up his own truths. Like I can be. What's true for you can be true, true for me or false for me and true for you. It does not matter. And that, and that is what, in historical sense, what you just were, were bringing up. So Henry VIII. Yeah, there's a, uh, go think, on, sorry. So, so if you go to Henry VIII, but before that, so the Protestant Reformation or rebellion, if you will, as I, I put it, is the very beginning of the, the destruction of truth in the, in the, in the, in the world. Or before that, there was the East and West Schism. Right, and schism okay. is a necessary precondition for divorce. Right, and they hold divorce. The Orthodox will allow divorce. Yeah, and I mean, the, if the, the meaning of marriage is the union of Christ and the church, then to attack that union for, through schism paves the way for divorce. It paves the way for everything that follows. And 
I was trying to say that we, because none of us is sinless, right. we realize that we've contributed to the descent and we can't just blame the next generation who go a bit crazier than we would have. Right. Um, right. And because even these teenagers, maybe in 15 years, they'll be looking at the next generation thinking, wow, they're really out of their minds. And it, it will just keep getting worse until there's nothing left, unless we realize our sinfulness, repent our sins, seek Christ, because he is the truth, which means he's the fullness of being. You know, this we can identify a moral truth, a logical truth, and an ontological truth. So right. the moral truth is where you say what you genuinely think. Right. You're being honest, right. you're, and you're showing that, manifesting that. The, the logical truth is where there's a um, an adequacy between the perceptions and reality that right. you've conformity. understood your, your thoughts co correspond to reality. Yeah, there's a conformity. there. Yeah. And the ontological truth is the being under the aspect of being known. So, and all being is knowable because God can know it. Right. It's, it's, and Jesus Christ is he's the fullness of being and he's perfectly known by the Father. And we need to know him in order to know what man is. He is the measure of man, not ourselves. Like you said, we can't right. separate ourselves from God and decide what we are because we will end up going down the plug hole. If we, are, if we become our own measure, then if we sink, then the measure sinks until there's nothing left. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. He right. never changes. He's the fullness. And what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah mm -hmm. is, is not just against nature that's written into our bodies. Right. But it's a St. Jude writes in his letter that it's like a blasphemy against the majesty of God. Right. It, it's, it's trying to, um, it, it inverts everything, putting a carnal pleasure before, although it's disgusting. I don't know where the yeah. pleasure comes in. I don't know what pleasure Putting that about. before <laughs> a reasonable good. Right. Um, and also two men together represents two, um, determinative principles which cannot combine they never do sorry that's another discussion yeah, um i fine. just mean that we as things accelerate and unravel and get crazy hopefully it becomes more and more evident to those who will be saved that we need to turn to jesus 100 percent, or we lose everything so like to, this descent to, to to go with that father forgive me it's kind of the way i talk i do have i have this interrupting habit that's okay and, and it kind of is a way i want to guide the con it's not because i'm being rude i get a lot of comments it's just sort of the way my when, when you say something something clicks because i can i'll forget like i just did earlier with mm -hmm. peter hitchens if i don't throw it out i'll forget it and i know it's really important because it popped up <laughs> so now that i just did it i just did it again anyway so what you're saying is unless we find christ right so this gets to something that i wanted to discuss with you since you are and and I am, and many people who will be watching this are seeing how important, in fact, politics will solve nothing. It is only as the restoration of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church, not just Christianity as a general concept, the, the, the restoration of the Catholic Church is the only solution at this point. I'm black-pilled on everything right. else. The only hope pill I have left is that the Catholic Church, because this is something I wanted to ask you if this is a true concept that came into my mind. If we can imagine Rome or the Vatican or just the Catholic Church as a whole as a sort of, um, let's just say a nuclear reactor, but instead of radiation, it, it spews truth, like truth radiates from it, either by word or deed or by just presence. Wouldn't it follow that in 1965, the year I was born, that when Vatican II came and basically blew out the candles on Catholicism, or started to at least, on uh, Catholicism or, or hiding the candle, if, any metaphor you want to use, would it also not make sense that that nuclear reaction will no longer happen into the world and the world would begin oh, to become... You know, just truth yeah. will truth will become dimmer and dimmer and unable to be found. It would be starving and We're blind. Starving. And that's how we feel. Darkness. Do you not feel that, yeah. Father? Right now, when you look at our media and our movies and our culture, 
That's a great word. Starving. That's the word that hits me the most. I starve for truth now. And when I yeah. find it, it becomes that much more precious. So there's that. Well, you, you, you quoted um, Jesus as the truth. Right. In the, the highest philosophical, theological truth that man ever worked out is perhaps St. Thomas Aquinas, his teaching on transubstantiation and the Holy Eucharist. Right. So, and he, he built on Aristotle with substance and accidents. And here you have, before the Blessed Sacrament, the fullness of being and truth who brings order into the world. Now, there were people even then and shortly after disputing this teaching out of their own inadequacy and arrogance and pride. They want to put forward their own ideas. Um, and after you get the Reformation, which neglects the scholastics, then they could never understand the nature of reality if they're not going to listen to the Catholic teaching on transubstantiation. It is the highest possible teaching on how the substance of things interacts with the accidents and our knowledge of them and the truth of them. So society starts falling apart because it distances itself from the truth on the Holy Eucharist, which Trent upheld beautifully for the Catholic Church. But outside the Catholic Church, you see things falling in more and more in line with the world and the prince of this world. And what we're talking and about, finally, Father, if, if I may, what we're talking about is the mass. You don't get the transubstantiation without the mass, right? Yeah. I mean, it so we get, need. Yeah, go ahead. We need we need the mass. And right. so, someone made a beautiful um, explanation to me recently about when Jesus was asleep in the boat and the s disciples were panicking because of the storm, thought they were going to perish. If you go to the Holy Eucharist now in the mass or reserved in the tabernacle or in adoration, you will get that same sense of peace that Jesus had when he's sleeping in the storm. He was not bothered by the waves and the wind. And we can get that right now, today, if we go to adore our Lord in the Holy Mass or in, in the tabernacle. We will be asleep with him on the on the pillow in the boat. I mean asleep, I just mean yeah, at peace, resting. at rest. Yeah. Yeah. So he's stilling the storm for the disciples. He's making an exterior sign of what can happen to us if we go to him. Because he is the solution to this thousand-year-long descent. He is the answer. He is the savior, the redeemer. And he will not fail. He will do it. And for us, our question is just, do we believe him or not? Do we, are we going to believe him and follow him? And if so, we can have peace despite the disintegration of the world. And it's the best thing we can do for the people we love because we don't want to lose the people we love. And yeah. I, I think of these kids, these 13-year-old kids identifying mm. in scores of genders or whatever. It just goes on they, and on. Yeah, the they need and they, they, to, to be rescued, right? Yes. And, but w w the best thing we can do for them is to make sure that we live close to Christ and fearless. And, and articulate the truth in public. You know, look, there's a lot of um, mainstream secular YouTubers who are beginning to acknowledge there is evil. There is the devil. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And I'm hearing them even talking about God, but they're not yet tradie Catholics. But I think it's going to become apparent to more people, you're either with Satan or you're with Jesus Christ. Right. There's no, no, no nowhere else. Well, in my... In my um... In my travels on social media, the the Chad Young uh, male who feels oppressed right now, more nine times out of ten is becoming Jesus is the answer. There are mm -hmm. there there is a, a reaction coming from the young men, and mostly the young men because see what's important, Father, is that men and women are also as a an objective truth. And I guess all the categories of truth are different. What the egalitarians have done with the truth of men and women have made us interchangeable. And we're not at all. Uh, a, a man, a man with a man's heart and a man's feeling as opposed to a feminine man, which is what we've created for the last 20 years, a feminine male, um, is yeah. that they fear danger. These new men, they fear danger. Yeah. And if you talk to these transgender 
people, the number one thing on their plate, and I know this from personal experience, the number one thing on their plate that they will bring up every time is the need to feel safe in any environment. And if you are against transgenderism, no matter how graciously, kindly, logically try to explain to them, they trigger and say they're unsafe. They feel unsafe. Stop talking to me. That's yeah. literally what we've become. And, and I think, I think, and, and please, I, I like you, your elaboration on masculinity and truth and so forth, because you being a, a, a soldier for truth, you have suffered in your past and people who know you and follow your history know that you've suffered for the truth and are willing to suffer for the truth. An effeminate man is not willing. And there's not, in a sense, let me, let me go back to the nature. So the nature of a woman is to be protective and to eschew danger. It's, her job is to, to protect. The home is to be safe. Her job mm -hmm. as God creator was to be safety minded. You no know, risk averse. And that's good for a woman, especially a mother. That's her job. Mm -hmm. She puts it on the husband to be the defender and the warrior and the soldier. Not anymore. Now it doesn't matter. Now the women are like supposedly tough and, and dangerous and, you know, risk takers. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like you said, an inversion. So I like to speak to the differences between a man and a woman and that truth. And the idea of being an effeminate man has destroyed our culture because effeminacy in men is a lie. Does that yeah. make sense? And we're seeing what are coming under attack are those fundamental truths revealed in Genesis 1 and 2. So the fact that the first truths are being attacked now, mm -hmm. I think is an indication that perhaps we're close to the end because there's not much more fundamental things to oppose and try and turn on their head. Right. Well, yeah, they're running That's out of the toys to play with break. <laughs> Out with the biggest break. difference between man and woman, perhaps, is that the man represents the divine mm -hmm. and the woman represents the created. Right, right. And th th they're different, right? Right. But if they weren't different, then we can't understand anything. Um, there needs to be a distinction for the beginning of comprehension. And they're, sho they're showing us two wonderful realities. The divine is the best reality. And the creator is the second best. Um, Which is similar to the Catholic uh, Holy Family. Our, our, our Blessed Virgin is one. And our, our, they work in tandem together. Well, she natures. is a figure for the whole of creation. Right. Uh, she's a figure for the perfect Garden of Eden, um, in, in which the, the tree of life takes root, which is ultimately Jesus Christ. But God, so God enters into his creation through the Blessed Mother, the female, who represents the whole of the creation. In a way, she represents the tabernacle because she's the tabernacle of God. He dwells inside her. She is for a while his temple, house of gold, we call her, because right. the temple was the house of gold in Jerusalem. And, and God the, came to live in her. In so, you know, she, she is representing something here greater than any uh, human being. And the man, he represents the divine, but he isn't the divine right. until we have Jesus Christ through Mary. I, I suppose the, the male, if you want to know how to be a man, look to Jesus. Right. And he certainly was not afraid of, of anything. He I, was rec very, I recently he was very... had a discussion on this topic about Jesus. Uh, uh, our Lord. Um, but can, I, all... sorry, can I say? Sure, sorry, go ahead. He, I'm sorry. He had fear in Gethsemane, right? Yes. But we, we can come to that later. He overcame it. Well, the, 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 it was a snippy Protestant who came at me about our, our Jesus, our, our having crucifixes, showing this defeated, weak Lord. He believes in a mighty Lord who resurrects. And I, my point to him was, do you realize what, how long he lived on a cross and what he went through to get to that cross is more than any man on this planet could ever endure yeah. strength wise. Yeah. Just if you just look on a secular level of what strength, Chad, muscleism, you know, all the things that today are popular. Who's yeah. more Chad than Jesus Christ when he can survive on the cross? And while he's on the cross, he's still saving souls. 
and still proclaiming the gospel till his last yeah. breath. So that's not a weak Christ when we look at a crucifix. <laughs> you know? it, it's it's the ultimate strength. Yes. Um, that that doesn't fear to um, sacrifice himself entirely. Well, can I ask you that, Father? That on this note, I want to go back a little personal. Don't you know? Uh, just don't don't cringe too much. But you fought certain fights, and I noticed that you're a, a person who is willing to sacrifice for the truth. Is this an instinct you have? Something you learned? Were your parents uh, any? I'm not trying to pry into your personal life per se, but I mean, were you raised with this notion of? Some things are worth dying for. Some things are worth fighting for. Some things, because it seems to be very lacking today, especially the truth. The fight for the truth is a, a lack. Well, my, my father was military and he flew helicopters, mm -hmm. He'd been in some uh, hard situations. Like, so when you're a kid, like a nine year old kid, and you mm -hmm. hear he goes down under fire to pick up a wounded. Mm. soldier mm -hmm. that. that's pretty good when you're a nine-year-old to yes. think okay that's the model right. and my yeah. mother and my grandmother in australia my grandmother was um following the trials for example of i can't remember his name he was a australian prisoner of war in north in korea during the okay. korean war all right and he compromised and went over to the communists and was trying to undermine the morale of the other australian prisoners Mm. really disgraceful that is it, i mean can you imagine hell on earth yeah. is being a prisoner of war in korea right and then you have this man from your own army undermining you um and he was put on trial in australia and my grandmother went to those trials because she was deeply interested yeah. in yeah. the Justice. um yeah and and the soviet threatening tyranny mm -hmm. who who at that time were with China, as it were, although that China, Russia, and North Korea weren't exactly on the same sheet there, but they're underwriting this side of the war. And then she had Burmese friends, you know, back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. She's watching what's happening in Burma. Um, and my my mother had a lot of literature, literature about uh, prisoners of conscience, which rubbed off on me. And I guess I realized for me, it's not... Courage, I don't know, I see it more as a thing of logic. If you do not fight your enemy and fight him hard, straight away, he will take over. I don't mean here a physical fight of violence with someone you don't like. I mean your yeah. real enemy, the devil. Right. He, Like the saints will say you need as a temptation and you need to kill these things straight away. I'm not saying I'm, that, I'm not that good. But right at the beginning of the conversation, I'm trying to say this mm. descent we've had to today's madness we're all guilty and we can't just blame the next lot and say, well, I've sinned with thoughts of impurity, for example, mm -hmm. but that's just in my head. It's the people who've gone worse. That's the problem. And they, if they say, well, no, my sins are not against nature. So it's the people who sin against nature that are the problem. And then those who sin against nature could say, no, as long as it's with a consenting adult, that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's when it's with a child, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, actually we have to just not like blame a segment of society or a half of society or another group, realize, no, we've all sinned. We're all responsible for the crucifixion. Well, you see, and if you're devoted are... to the truth, you will be humble. Is what you're saying is we have to be humble and understand right. that the, the real enemy is not your brother who sins. Your real enemy is the one who causes your brother to sin. Yeah, and, and you. causes you to sin. As it's I the said, one who, and you, right, and you. Yeah, right, and because that we, by our sins, caused the crucifixion. Yes. Which that picture of Christ on the cross is the most beautiful thing in the whole of history. Mm -hmm. Because if you look with the eyes of the body, you see all this blood and torture and agony. That's horrific. But if you look with the eyes of faith, and you see the Son of God uh, dying for us, you know. But people, just to go on a tangent, yeah, ask yeah. about the Latin Mass and say, "Oh, I don't yeah. speak Latin." How can I understand right. it? Right. You, you can go to mass every day for 10 years. You, I don't think you're going to understand who died on the cross. It was God. Not by word alone, right? You need visual. Yeah, right? try and understand that. And then try and understand why he died mm -hmm. for our sins. That will take you another 20 years. Just think about that. God died for our sins. 
doesn't matter what language it's in, you've got more than enough to contemplate. And then if we think, what's the purpose? To bring us to heaven. Right. Like by this point, we, we Eternal life. why are we interested if it's what language it's in? Latin is perfect. Right. And um, because there's endless, inexhaustible truths for our meditation there that then well, change this, us when we go. This will show the difference between what I feel is the Catholic and the Protestant version of, of Christianity is that they kind of trivialize truth. As far as all the arguments I've ever had with them, I'm not judging them. I'm saying because of how they've been misled, they have this very shallow buddy Jesus kind of idea of God, yeah. as opposed to a Catholic is, as you say, as a Catholic can grab a single concept and spend his whole life meditating upon that one concept, finding truth mm -hmm. within truth within truth. That goes deeper right. and deeper because God is an abyss of truth. There's just no end. So you have religious like Elizabeth of the Holy Trinity, was it? Who will take a, a single dogma in their name that they can devote themselves to right. their whole life. Okay. Dedicated right. life. Um, now, to get back to truth, Father, if I may. So as a concept. So a couple of things. Truth is important because it's it's it truth shows us how we think, what we know, how we perceive the world. Uh, how we perceive each other and we know who our friends are. And to your point just now, knowing who our enemies are, which is very important because I think there's a lot of people who actually look right past somebody or some things that are their direct enemy uh, and how we live our lives and how we die. What, what can we do? I know we're going to pray. We're always, that's just an assumption as Catholics. So I'm, I, if you say, what are we going to do? We're going to pray. Yes, and we're going to go to Mass, and we're going to make ourselves as truthful as possible before God and be good examples. But we used to live in, this is one of P Peter Hitchens' other points, we used to live in a high, we live in a high trust society in the West. So in England and America, it was something called a high trust society. Uh, and I can give you an example of that where I live in Pennsylvania, in that we have a high trust state but in gradation, so we can show you. So if you lived in Philadelphia and you set up a tomato stand and put a little jar saying tomatoes are a dollar a, a, a can yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And you put that there and you leave a couple bucks there just to give people the idea and you leave the tomatoes and the money will be gone within an hour if you're lucky. All right. And then right. they'll laugh at you for even doing it. And I had I have a friend, and I'll give you an anecdote about this. But if you go west of Pe Pennsylvania, near where I live, and even a little farther into Lancaster or Armist country, where they have a very high trust society built, they have full stands out, not just tomatoes. They have full stands, money jars to make change for yourself, right. to to bring to bring your vegetables home, and they grow them and they put them there, and it works. Maybe somebody once in a while is a real creep and, you know, but overall those stands actually work out here. And I had a friend who used to live in Philadelphia and he remembers going on a day trip with his family out this way. And he saw this thing and it blew his mind so much. He sold everything he had, got out of the city and moved super West, even if it meant two or three hours to drive mm -hmm. for his job. Now he didn't care. It was worth it. And, and yeah. what I'm saying to you is, how do we re? I think the question I'm trying to get to is, how do we reinstill this battle for truth that we should have? That we should have this instinct like you have. I believe I do. I get in a lot of arguments, and people are saying I'm always argumentative, but it's not really just for arguing. I see something is not true or something bad. I I don't wait. I say, look, this isn't right. Let me say why. And then the, I get in a lot of fights with family and so forth. I don't mean right. to. But anyway, so maybe if we see if we see the the devil is our ultimate enemy. We right. have enemies on earth, but we right. have which Jesus tells us to love our enemy. We need to understand that pray properly. For them. Yes. The devil we don't love in any circumstances. He's damned. He's in hell. He's to be hated in in, in every sense. Um, and if we are concerned for our uh, brothers who have fallen, because we're in this together in a sense. That can have you lost the sound there? No, I'm good. I'm sorry. Don't mind me. Go ahead. Um, I'm just making sure everything's working. <laughs> right. Sorry, go ahead. Um, 
so the question was, you know, what can we do to reinstill this uh, vigor, uh, this uh, zeal to defend truth at all costs? I mean, if they, if we let people go down, if we abandon them, we're in great danger of losing our own souls. So t- two examples. One, the church, the bishops are, are lying all the time now because they say they're listening to everyone and what they're clearly not hearing, which must be mendacious. It must be a lie because it's so obvious. It's malice. They say sure. everybody's welcome in the church. Mm-hmm. All their LGBTQ, whatever, mm-hmm. all welcome. Now, everyone has always been welcome right, in a Catholic church. Right. It's just they don't go to receive Holy Communion unless they're in a state of grace. It's right. the teaching. Mm-hmm. And they never talk about that, the, the bishops, or h- hardly any. But they'll talk about the opposite. They'll talk about the church hasn't been welcoming enough. We need to now be welcoming at the same time that they're trying to crush tradition. But it's such a simple thing to say. Everyone has been always been welcome and is welcome and should come to Mass to worship God. But because we want you to get to heaven, you have to be in a state of grace to receive the Blessed Sacrament. Otherwise, you will receive condemnation. You will go to hell. If knowingly, not in a state of grace, you receive Holy Communion. If you do that and do not repent it, it leads to hell. The bishops aren't saying this. So they're they're hiding the truth. How is this love of people who are confused about their sexuality? It is not love. Mm -mm. If, If we realize that we're in it together, then you're willing to say the hard truth to people, even though they're going to resent you for it and perhaps hate you and say horrible things about you. Well, so what? Mm-hmm. You would you would do it for your own family. Mm-hmm. And we have to realize we, we are actually a, a, a family. We can't, at the end of the day, like a whole lot of people are going to go to hell and a whole lot are going to go to heaven. We don't know who, who or right. our, of ourselves either. We have right. to work that out. But we can hope for every single person who's still, um, well, we, even whether they've died, we can still pray for them after their death. Right. So this might sound... I don't know if this will make the connection strongly enough. I think in schools, what we need to see is a bit of healthy, low-level bullying when boys (laughs) come out acting gay or camp. Because if you have low-level bullying, then no one is going to develop that behavior. Father, you're speaking speaking about shame in society that used to be. If you watch the old British, as an American, I watch the old British shows with a proper English spoken and there was this great big Victorian wall built that, I mean, even shows like Bernie, uh, Wooster and I forget what it's called. Something in Wooster. Yeah. Jeeves and Wooster. Jeeves and Wooster. So you see this great big facade of manners and, uh, structure and trust that even dash it all. He says, dash it all. And all the women go, <gasps> you know, <laughs> Yeah. So there's this thing that was built in society called shame. That isn't a shame. It's a good thing. It's a, 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 a mitigating thing. And like you say, yeah. we are now being told to be ashamed of shaming, which is such a really yeah. And we know story. that it said some teenagers will be confused about this, and yeah. they, if they can be protected for three years from experimenting or whatever Mm -hmm. because of a bit of low level bullying, then they'll Mm -hmm. come out the other side intact and just develop a normal, healthy life. Um, And if you take it up a level, I'd say to pride marches, you don't get pride marches in Russia because the men will not tolerate it. And it's not low level bullying then. And the police will put you down. (laughs) The police will disrupt the pride march quite rightly. Mm -hmm. It should be, so I'm not suggesting now that people should attack pride marches. That would be chaotic no. and disordered. But the police, this, the council shouldn't allow it. If it goes ahead, the police should disband it. And then over time, you'd hope that they would feel that society doesn't accept this because they realize it's tearing everybody down. Everybody. You, you, it, it's, we can't just retreat and tolerate this lie against our neighbor and against God. That, well, the, makes, the family, that makes us weak. Well, the families Unmanly. are victimized by this. Uh, personally, in America, I can't speak to all the world's school systems. The American public school system should just be scrapped. There's actually no restorative way to fix it. It is complete 18th century garbage. 
and it should well, be just gone. <laughs> so uh, maybe we, this it's only a collapse which is going to remove all these corrupt. So okay, Father. A, so this is something I've always I always ask all the Catholic priests: Is it a sin for me to hope for a collapse? Not not I in think, their not I mean a total like a real collapse that will cause people to snap out of it, even if it means if death and hoping. If you're hoping that people turn to God and yes. snap out of it, yeah. that's a good thing. Okay. If the only way you can see that happening is through a collapse, right? Then it's not licit to work for that collapse. It's not licit right. to disorder things. But you could say, you know, dear God, how long? How please, long, if you're going to chastise us, then Father, do you if you knew how many times I said that psalm, that one little sentence from David, "How long, O Lord?" It's kept me yeah, out you of know, a lot of trouble. When it does come. When it does come, yes, we, we will all be hoping that we used the time well beforehand. So, in fact, we don't want to hurry it up because God no. knows why he's delaying. So right. we need to use this time to develop our, our faith, our hope, our charity, because otherwise when it comes. For example, I was talking to someone today about the digital currency, global digital right, currency. Right. That's scary. Yeah. You, absolutely have to resist that and have right. no part in it but you will be made to feel like you are the only one that you're alone it could be that you may 30 percent of the world are resisting it but right. you won't know all the information will be that nearly everybody's going with it and right. you're the only idiot that won't and it, it's very hard to stand when you're in solitary um then you need your relationship with god and we need to to develop that now, deepen that now. So when these things come, that like the whole COVID um, vaccine tyranny mm -hmm. is just in God's mercy, he's letting people realize that this world is run by Satanists. Yes. Yeah, they hate us. They want us dead. Well, I and want to go back to that point. Now, incredibly, okay. since Vatican II is not defending us, not feeding the flock, but Francis is a servant of these evil forces. And and people are so upset to hear that. I think they, they blank it out. But, you know, nothing in history repeats exactly. God has shown us plenty of lessons of history, right. of the importance of obedience and the greatness of the papacy. Right. Finally, he's showing us what happens when the papacy loves the world more than it loves God. Well, there's two stories here we could tell. There's a story of Vatican I, and there's a story of Vatican II. Now, Vatican I, interestingly, to your point about God's time frame and how things uh, happened, was in just after the American Civil War for Americans here watching this. That that's about the time frame that Vatican I happens. And right at that same time when the church is dogmatically proclaiming, you know, the papacy and the strength and the hierarchy of the Catholic church in a dogmatic way was just when all these false truths that we're talking about, the enlightenment era of coming to fruit, modern modernism, uh, communism, Marxism, all these isms were, were budding on the tree and God brings Vatican I. And um, mm -hmm. so Vatican I establishes that there's a truth, there's truth. And that just to get back to our theme on truth, that there's an absolute truth and it can be known absolutely. And it can be infallibly discerned, not created. A pope discerns mm -hmm. truth infallibly. He does not make truth. The, you know, am I correct? Is that a correct sentence? Yeah. And that's yeah. the big thing that Protestants try to accuse our popes of making things. A good pope only discerns truth infallibly. This is right. apostolic. Yes. I, I think and, we can see something similar in the last century with the dogma of Our Lady's bodily assumption into heaven. Right. Which was 1950. Right. And I think in 1953 or 54, there was some um, adjustments made to the feast of Our Lady's maternity. I, I might have that slightly wrong. Okay. And that is such a great thing, in fact. The dogma of the assumption is awesome. It's amazing mm -hmm. that Our Lady went body and soul into heaven and is there now, right. reigning as queen of the angels, queen of heaven and earth. 
And after that was done and achieved, we we see if if it was in 53 or 54, the feast mm -hmm. of Our Lady's Maternity, which I might have wrong, it might be the her, her, her purity of her Mary, That's right. Mary's purity That's or her right. name. But um then you have the changes to the Holy Week, and then Vatican II, and then all hell breaks loose. But right. if there's this massive cosmic fight between good and evil, then heaven is so delighted that human beings, the church, the children of God, have worked out to promulgate the dogma of the assumption from the Pope and all the bishops of the world, united with the faithful, to rejoice in this. Mm -hmm. The assumption, who cares what happens after that for 100 years? Like, yeah, the, right. hell is furious that that has actually been achieved. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So if we try and put it in perspective, although we're seeing terrible things happening now, which which are, it's a lot to do with this. You reject Catholicism in the Reformation. You lose the philosophy of transubstantiation. Then you no yes. longer know substance and accidents. So Kant says we can't know the substance of things. You change the mass um, in 1960s. And then you say you can't have a nature of things. And that's why we have transgender. Right. And perhaps, yes, changing the mass and the roles of people in the mass. Mm -hmm. it, but the however bad all this is, what's going to be remembered in heaven is all the acts of truth and love like the dogma of the assumption being proclaimed by um, weak human beings who, by God's grace, were able to do that. Well, to clarify it, what a dogmatic statement says, it doesn't create something new and then, hey, we've discovered something. It says this is something that the church has believed since the apostles. And I, yeah. I, I liken it to a, a church, uh, to a boat that's heading into a squall. The cook runs into the kitchen and starts battening down all the pots and pans. So what the church had did says we see a storm coming and our lady, these truths about our lady are in danger. We're locking this down, pal, forever. You're not going to yeah. loosen this. So you can come at us yeah. with all you want. This truth, this dog is now a dogma. It was always true. But now we've locked it down. It can't be reinterpreted in truth like we're talking about how truths can be twisted. You can't twist right. that one anymore. Sorry. And yeah. like you said it, I'm sure it enraged Satan that, that we have yeah. this great fury against us from the 50s on. And it will be a, a glory for eternity right. that the church did this. Right. Whereas the raging of Satan and the corruption, it brings no win to him now in time, and it will bring no win to him in eternity. It will actually just increase his punishment for eternity, all Russia the destruction he's wreaking now. Yes. And that increase of his punishment will just speak to God's justice and power for eternity. So it's like kind of win, win. Yeah. The e evil is this privation. A lie is a, a denial of the order of things or the being of things. Right. But it's not actually an alternative thing that the devil is presenting to us because he he doesn't have he can't present any new thing. He, has no he can't truth. create. As we as right. we read in Timothy, he's uh, was it Timothy? Yeah. yeah. So his whole madness now is is about distracting us from the our blessed lady's assumption or our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, for example. He's mm -hmm. distracting us from that with um, d division and panic and craziness. Um, but he can't actually present an alternative, much of an alternative story. Even something like communism is a derivative a thinned out twisted version of christianity oh yeah it's a religion it's a alter yeah. religion it's an antichrist version it's an ape of ape of the church kind of thing it, uh are you're aware of uh, father rippinger right um uh, yeah yes well he's an exorcist and he says something interesting and this is to we could probably end up the wrap up the video because i want to wrap up on a, a, no, a note of hope for everybody and one of the and when things get are bad like this, what he he mentioned in a lot of his exorcism is when he's getting he knows he's getting close to actually freeing the soul. The devil starts putting on the pyrotechnics. Now things start falling around the room. Now he, he's, he's trying to scare you with just scare tactics. He has nothing left in his arsenal, no subtle 
teachings, no slip of the tongues. Now he's coming at you full force because he has nothing left in his arsenal. He's throwing his hand grenades. And, and to your point that what we see now is the devil in desperation is like coming at just the most basic truths. A man is mm. define woman. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator. I can't define woman. You know, mm. it's like the insanity of that is should give us hope to know that this is a lash of desperation on the part of the evil one. I think so, because it's no longer he can't have a long term sustainable plan oh, here. The right, devil. Right. In this. Everything's right. falling apart and he's destroying his own side. Yeah, and they're right. all becoming sterile. They're making themselves sterile. So he his plan, which he's been working at, you know, from the beginning, actually. Right, sure. But although I think he needs to wait till the church proclaims the truth before he really gets it. But once the church reveals the truth or the, the, the deposit of faith, then he, like when the church teaches about the goodness and strength of the family, then he understands what he needs to attack. Right. Or even if he, with his intelligence, understood oh, it before, I see. Yep, I see your it's point. hard for him to communicate that to his minions on earth. So they need to see what's in church documents, like the great teaching of the papal encyclicals mm -hmm. in the 19th century about politics and the family. Right. That actually also became a program for the enemy of the church to attack. But the advantage to the Catholics is greater than the advantage to the enemy. But he did have a long-term plan. He wanted to get hold of the papacy, right? right. He's, he's wanted that for a long time. Yeah, the Freemason said so right out in front. Yeah. And if anybody's so, closer to Freemasonry, it's Bergoglio, in my opinion. But go ahead. And if, if he's now sterilizing the people that are, are close to him, mm -hmm. then the only thing they've got left is trying to get hold of the children of the Catholics, which they try to do through the schools and through government agencies now, it's scary. Mm -hmm. But you've then reached the point where um, it, it just can't... He's burning his bridges behind him. If they, a, they, if, I don't believe no they'll retreat. succeed to get control of children. But if they do, then it's over then. But I don't think they will. I think then there's going to be this kickback. We, we need the reign of Christ the King. That was your first quote today, yeah. right, about what is truth. Yeah, we need his true. reign 100%. No, no compromise anymore. You, you might have lived in a society with divorce, okay, or maybe lived with, with contraception. So I don't want to use it, but I can tolerate that society has it. Like in the pharmacy, it's there for sale. Right. Uh, I think we should understand. No, if that's on sale in the pharmacy, th that pharmacy needs to be shut down. Right. But because you can't that's do it without society. leadership or authority, unfortunately. Otherwise, you have anarchy. I'm not talking about going into... No, no, I don't mean... I, I understand you're not. What I'm saying but, is we're waiting... If the church could just speak clearly again. Yeah. And, I mean, the fact that... The fact that Francis Bergoglio said next to nothing when the United States Supreme Court agreed to homosexual marriage. He mm -hmm. said next to nothing about it. When, if you could imagine, maybe I, I would imagine in the 30s, if the United States did such a thing, <laughs> the, across America, every bishop would get a letter from the Pope and they would be shutting down cities. You know, mm. there would be no commerce with Catholics as long as this stands in, in the courts. Mm -hmm. Bergoglio was like, eh, well, that's, you know, country's own business. We, I don't like to get involved in politics. <laughs> yeah. <But> right. <laughs> So okay. should we find that note of hope? So that I think so that the note, well, Our Lady of Fatima is always a, a note of hope for me. And the fact that yeah. we've discussed today how God has dipped his toe into the world every time and sent Our Lady every time, just when things are going to get bad. So as we see in 1917, I, what happens in 1917 in Russia, what happens in Portugal, Our Lady appears. So I have this hope that I have a feeling that somewhere in this Ukrainian Russian thing, we're going to see something similar to Fatima. I can't predict it, but it's a hope. Our Lady is my hope, I say, because she is our protectress. Like we said, that men are the fighters and Jesus is the fighter. Well, Mary is our protector. And right. Father Kramer said to me, I said, Father, but the only thing about, like I said earlier, about worrying about the, the breakdown, you know, I don't want to hope for it, but on the other hand, it does 
hope for that it comes. He goes, well, there's two things. You're either chosen to be a martyr and suffer and die in it, or you're chosen by Our Lady to be protected from it. You'll, you may suffer, but you'll be protected ultimately your soul and maybe even your body and your family. But either way, it's a win-win. You'd be a martyr, but not everybody's called to be a martyr, right, Father? Not right. everybody has that. But but everybody has called to be constant in their faith. And that one way or the yeah. other, we win. Would you agree with that? Yeah, if, and that's it, being constant in the faith, yeah. having a rule of life, what the prayers one will have each day or on a weekly cycle or with the first Saturdays or first Fridays as well, a monthly cycle. Yes. Um, recognizing the Easter Triduum as the high point of the year, um, doing everything one can, I'd say, to get to a traditional Triduum pre-55 if not don't give the priest a hard time go to the 62 although that's the beginning of the novus ordo right I understand. but if one can bring an old missile then one can have the right prayers and right. if yeah just um constancy st steady hope our, our lady never panicked no so it's 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 tragic what's happening around us but the the victory is in the bag. Um, so we can rest with our Lord in the boat during the storm. We don't, we don't have to wait for him to calm the storm to have the peace. We can have the peace during the storm. Mm -hmm.